Hallo und willkommen zurück zu The Age of Decadence. Ja, wir sind immer noch hier bei, diesen, ähm, bei diesem arena viertel dings und schauen uns hier weiter um. Wir haben hier noch das Fort. Ich nehme mal an, dass wir da gar nicht reinkommen. What do you want, boy? Okay. Seht your business. Oh, move along. Na, haben wir leider keins. Dann halt nicht. Da kann man nicht hin. Ah. Trade District. Mm. Da ist ein Doors. Domitius. You see a middle-aged man with a weathered face, half ridden by a scraggly beard. You ask if he's a Domitius Ulpius, and the man nods and steps back, letting you in. What can I do for you, stranger? asks Domitius tiredly. Lord Antida sent me to find the temple. You're my first stop. I don't see how I can help you, since I never found it, says the man cautiously. You know more than I do, and the very least you can tell me where the temple is not. Well, I suppose it's not really a secret. According to the map, the temple is somewhere near e northeast of Ta uh, Terran. But the map hasn't been drawn to scale, so it's almost impossible to pinpoint the exact location. What's worse is the maps have been drawn before the war, so many places the map refers to are no longer there. There were reports of a buried temple east of Mardoran. So that's where we started. We set up camps and started combing the desert, looking for the signs of the temple. The problem is, the desert never stays the same. Wind constantly shifts the sands, making dunes and moving them at will. Entire towns have been known to disappear under the shifting sands, so looking for a buried temple in a desert is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Still, we were optimistic, but that's when the attacks came. Attacks? We were too close to Maduran, too close for Gallius' comfort. I'm not sure. Uh, what he thought we were doing there, but it's very clear that he wanted us gone. At first our scouts started disappearing and then smaller camps came under attacks. After losing a third of our men and some gear, we were forced to pack up and leave. You mentioned a buried temple. Several caravan masters reported seeing a bury buried a complex emerging from the sand, the top of some pyramid surrounded by towers. They said it was pretty big, as big as Terran even. Do you believe them? Their accounts were consistent, and they had no reason to lie. At the time, there's uh, at the same time, deserts often play tricks on one's eyes. So perhaps they all saw what wasn't there. Go on. We kept moving northeast until we came to a dead river and the ruins of some dock. The riverbed was covered in fog. We could see the remains of some ships, but not much else. We lowered several men down there and sent them to look for a way up, but they didn't return. Then we split our group in two. One went north to look for a way across the river. The, uh, across the river. The other went south. I was with a group that went north. We didn't find a way across, but we found something far more interesting. A temple carved into the face of a mountain. At first, we even thought we'd found the temple that the gods led us to it. What happened then? We rushed inside. We really thought we'd found it, but we all knew that Antidas was after. But we all knew what Antidas was after. Had the temple already been looted, it would have been worthless. We had to find something valuable to bring back, something that would have made us all rich men. We had good lawmasters with us. Antidas spared no gold on getting the best man. And they were b worth every coin. They knew what to look for and what to do with it before any of us could even blink. They went through this temple like hounds following sand. They found hidden chambers and a moving platform to take us down to the lower levels. We thought we found the inner sanctum, but instead we found hell itself under our very feet. 
I knew what it was the moment I saw it. Hellgate from the old stories. I begged the lawmasters to leave it alone, but they were lost in the machines. I doubt they heard a word I said. And so I left them to their fate. A few men went with me, but most stayed there. When the ground shook, I knew the fools had awakened the machines. Then they heard the first screams. We knew better than to go back and try to save anyone. Is that why you've never tried to find this te the, the temple again? It changed something in me. I mean, we've all heard the stories about the olden days, but when they become real right before your eyes, you start thinking. What other stories are real? What if Gallius is right to fear the artifacts? Maybe really should look, lock them up and throw them throw away the key. I hope you never find it, says Domitius quietly. Mm. I've heard about this place. A raider told me that he stumbled upon a place similar to what you described. He found nothing but skulls and bones there. None of his men made it out alive. Das ja, ist aber auch schön, dass wir da wieder so eine Cross-Referenz haben. The same fate befell my man. It was probably their skulls and bones that had yeah, that he'd seen there. With most of my men dead, we could continue even we couldn't continue even if we wanted to. But I can assure, assure you that we lost our taste for adventure in that accused accursed place. What about the other group, the one that went south? I have never heard from them again. I assume they are all dead, much like the rest of the expedition. You remember where the temple in the mountains was? Somewhere northeast from here. A few, a few weeks journey, maybe more. I wish I could be of more help, but my job was to keep us moving forward and secure the temple. Not to fiddle with an uh, ast astrolable or so. Whose job was it? Gaius Levinus. He was the best cartographer I've worked with, but I am not sure he can help you much either. He was with me all the way and it changed him too. He stayed with me for a year, mostly staring blankly and talking to himself, then went to Ganesa. You gain a new insight, which can be used to increase skills. 19 skill points. Oha. Antidas mentioned the Tower of Zamedi. Antidas wanted us to find the way, uh, way in. I told him that we should stay clear of it, but he didn't want to hear that. What else can you tell me? I've often wondered about the map itself over the years. I've seen a fair number of them and none were made by a cartographer. My guess is that they were made by the temple's acolytes. They did their best, but they didn't really know what they were doing. My question is why? It's almost as if they knew that something was coming and were told to make maps to ensure that the temple will be found one day. Thank you for your help. Help. Mm-hmm. When you step outside, you're immediately surrounded by the Aurelian guards. They aren't hostile, at least not yet. A praetor steps forward and gives you an appraising look. Lord Gellius desires the pleasure of your company, he says formally. It would be most unwise to refuse the invitation, he adds after the pause. And if I refuse, you'll die. If not now, then later. His lordship merely wishes to discuss an area of common interest with you. If he wanted you dead, you'd be dead already. Mm, all right, let's go then. Let's go see him. You enter the main hall. At the far end of it, Lord Gallius holds court, receiving daily visitors in the order of their importance. A row of guards form a barrier between the Lord and the house and, and the petitioners, with blank stares on their faces. Another row forms a semicircle around Gallius, their eyes constantly scanning the crowd. Approach. So, Antidas still wants to find the temple. He doesn't learn, does he? asks Gallius. He speaks like a true statesman, addressing the audience rather than speaking directly to you. Last time he sent a small army, this time he sent you. Are you that good? Or is Antidas de that desperate? Why do you care? Because those who don't understand what they are doing are the ones who should be watched the most. Do you have any idea what it is that you are trying to find for Antidas? They say it was a place of great power. Would you deliver that power, abandoned for a good reason, mind you, to Antidas, who will put it to use without hesitation? Would you destroy what's left of our lands? Would you rather I deliver it to you? I'd rather 
it remains lost, but since there is no shortage of fools willing to look for it, I want to find it and seal it for good, and I want you to help me. So you aren't tempted by the power at all. Tempted by the power that destroyed an empire? I think not. I'm well familiar with the old world's magic and trust me when I tell you that it can't be controlled. When you unleash a hurricane or a wildfire, don't complain when it burns your house down. Desperate men might be willing to risk it all, but I am far from desperate. Today I rule the largest city and in 10 years I will rule all, with or without your help. But I can assure you that helping me will be a lot more rewarding than meddling in my affairs. You want me to believe that all those magi were fools who played with fire? Does the world around you not speak for itself? The magi tampered with the very fabric of reality. What unfathomable arrogance and blindness. Hundreds of years have passed, but this city still bears the uh, scars. I suggest you visit the abyss if you haven't already done so. It's a reminder of the horrors of the past and a warning to heed its lessons. What do you think about the stories of demons and gods? We've been awfully quiet since the war, haven't they? Uh, they've been awfully quiet since the war, haven't they? One can almost think that they were invented by fools like Antidas, who couldn't face the fact that the Empire was brought to its knees by some savages from beyond the sea. Supernatural beasts uh, had to be involved somehow. So how did the savages bring the Empire to its knees? You know what I think? The Empire had ruled for too long, unopposed and gone soft. The Kantari caught them by surprise, and by the time we've uh, remembered how to fight, the war was all but lost, caution was thrown to the wind and the Magi were given a free reign. They won the war, but we are still paying the price. What do you know about the temple? Not that much, actually. I believe that I heard about it for the first time when Antidas mounted his expedition. I've consulted my law master since then, but all I've learned is that it was the temple of Toragoth, the artificer. It was said that the Magi traveled there to improve their craft and build arcane devices to great power, which certainly explains Antidas' interest. Antidas isn't a fool. No. Uh, no, he has found a way to control magic. He must be a very powerful Magus then, to prevail where thousands of the Imperial Magi had failed. What do you want me to do? I want you to find the temple and deliver it to me. Mm, and if I say no? Then I'll tell you that I will never allow this power to fall into Antidas' hands, no matter the cost. Should you do the right thing and help me seal the temple, I will not overlook it and reward you generously. Thus, your choice is between being hunted and killed and being rewarded and elevated. Not a hard choice at all. I'll consider it. Leave. Gellius tells the guard to take you back and they dutifully escort you to Domitius' house. <clears throat> Okay. Interessant. It's a wretched looking house with a damp floor and crude furniture put together uh, from rotten boards savaged elsewhere. The inhabitants of the house stare at you, ready to defend their hovel with their lives. Da oben kann man nicht hin. A fallen minaret. A fallen minaret blocks your way, marking the end of the district. The gate still stands, but you can see nothing save for some ruins behind it. As you step closer, the temporary occup occupants of the minaret, several beggars resting on filthy straw beds, give you hard looks, but don't move an inch. Noch nicht mit reden. Da kann man auch nicht hin. Aha. As you walk down the street, you hear shouts and see an angry crowd pursuing several men. They chase them into a nearby house and start discussing the best way to smoke them out. A lone guard shows up and tries to calm the tensions, but without visible success. Approach. Burn them! yells a red-faced burly man in a dirty tunic, pointing at the house. The crowd seems to share his uh, animosity towards the house's inhabitants. 
Nobody's burning anything in my district, says the guard weakly. He tries to infuse his words with authority, but he isn't eager to risk his life to restore order, which only emboldens the crowd. What's going on? It's the nutters, sighs the guard. Now that they got that they've got some numbers behind them, things are starting to get out of control. Earlier, they went through the district shouting, pushing over cars and pissing people off. Uh, carts. There was a fight. Three dead, a dozen wounded. The preacher and his cronies hold in there. He nods at the house. And now these idiots want to burn it down and half a district with it. The nutters? The mouth breathers who follow these preachers around, eating up every word and asking for more. We didn't see it coming when it started. These preachers were talking crazy but nobody listened. So what's the harm, right? And then something changed. Suddenly they were drawing crowds. People were repeating their shit like it meant something. And now we have bloody riots in the middle of the day. What preachers? Ever since Meru went nuts and started talking about gods, some people took it upon themselves and spread his teaching and bring the fucking light to our darkness. Now, as far as I know, the preachers never said a word about attacking the unbelievers, but maybe they didn't have to. Make a man feel righteous and there's no telling how far he will go. But do they preach? The usual shit. The godless will be punished, the righteous will be saved. Need any help? Can you keep the crowd in check while I go and get more men to handle it properly? Sure. Mm -hmm. Regulus, the guard leaves you in charge and quickly walks away. The crowd gets its, ho its hopes up and moves a few steps closer. That preacher ain't going anywhere, says the burly man. We had enough of this of his shit. Um, the preacher will be dealt with in accordance with the house of law. Uh, laws of House Aurelian. Any attempt to rob our lord of his right to dispense punishment will be considered a grave insult, punishable by removal of the offender's right arm. All right, says the burly man, spitting and narrowly missing your feet. Have it your way, but if we ever catch this fucker in our neighborhood, he's ours. Wait for the crowd to leave and go inside the house. You see a man with a thin face, a narrow, aquiline nose, and fire in his eyes. This must be the preacher. Behind him stand two men, roughed up and bloodied. Who are you? asks the preacher. You gain a new insight? Drei Skillpunkte. A friend, it's safe to come out now. The gods worked a miracle through you, my child, much like they always do. It is the righteous man like you that make this world worth saving. Thank you, brother. So what happened here today? My congregation wanted to share their love for the gods with their neighbors, for it is a duty of every believer to bring the light of true faith into the hearts of others. Yet apparently such roads are filled with perils. The faithful were attacked, spat on, knocked to the ground and beaten. We had to defend ourselves, but our creed isn't a militant one and we fared poorly. All but those two lucky souls are dead now. I'm glad I could help then. We are in your debt, and this debt will be repaid. I bring the word of your deeds to the holy city of Ganesa. Mhm. Eigentlich hätte ich dir jetzt festnehmen wollen mit der Hilfe der Wache, aber naja, okay. Mhm. Da geht's in die Slums, da sollten wir vielleicht auch nicht hingehen. A beggar. Show kindness to a veteran. Show kindness to a veteran, good master, barks the scowling beggar when you come too close. A coin or two is all I ask. Come on, we both know you can afford it. Give him five imperials. Much obliged, says the beggar, offering a practice military salute. Are you really a veteran? Antiras finest, says the man with a bitter smile. Yeah, wrong side, I know, but it's hard to tell them apart beforehand. Every lord makes it sound like his cause is righteous. And his side is going to come out the winner, but in the end, it always comes to a roll of a dice. How did you end up here? It's a long story, you sure I have time for it? Natürlich, I'd like to hear it. Alright, so yeah, I served Antidas, but it was more than a job for me. I took the oath and meant every word, God help me. I didn't believe any of the Antidas, the last emperor bullshit, that the Kurds 
people always went on about. For me, what mattered was that Antidas actually gave a shit. I'd worked for the Comercium years before, so I knew how rich bastards can treat you, but Antidas was different. He'd actually spent time with his man. He said the prophecy wasn't just about him, that we were all part of it. And that the words themselves were just empty blather without good men to back them up and follow his lead. We were the foundation upon which the house was built, he said. Fine words, though I know it must sound like so much horse shit coming from me. Things were really gearing up by the time I joined. His father had left him the throne less than a year prior, you see, so Antidas was chomping at the bit to get things rolling, considering how cautious and miserly his father has been. He spent a lot of gold on payroll so his recruiters could complete, uh, compete with the Imperial Guards and began outfitting his men in armor of the Guards' old Imperial style. Pretty soon the common folk took house Daraton for the real descendant of the Empire, while the so-called Imperial Guard took the role of a shameful pretender staffed by ill-armored lepers. The ranks began to swell and in a little over a year Antidas was ready to stake his claim. Luck favored Antidas. The Ordu had begun a huge push to the south and Gellius had to bleed his own legions to beef up the guards to the north. Gallius knew it would risk the legitimacy of the Charter if he did nothing but spend his time with some Bactrian belly dancers, while the guards died defending his backyard from the greatest threat since the Cantari, so he didn't have much choice in this matter. That whole mess took Gallius' carefully arranged game, uh, game board and threw it into the abyss and Antidas was poised to exploit the situation. He sent his uncle to Ganesa to sell Meru on a joint attack against Gallius. He gave him a hundred soldiers and guess who was in charge of that entourage? Yours truly. Meru's mind was soft, was soft like clay, easy to mold, and the deal was struck within a week. Soon after, we were ready to march to war. With Gallius fighting a war on three sides, the Daraton front had become a soft underbelly. This was still Aurelian, though, and Daraton was still the weakest house, so there was no certain outcome. Nonetheless, Antidas belted Gallius with everything he had. I don't know whether tactics or numbers won that first battle, but we absolutely bled those bastards. House Daraton had accomplished a def decisive victory, the first in decades, but all Antidas did was salute his men and walk the battlefield as calmly as if he were enjoying a stroll in the garden. He wanted it to seem as though this was all a matter of course. Course, It must have taken a godly effort to hold in the pride he felt. And as for us, we didn't even bother trying. What happened then? Well, it all went to shit, of course, but you already know that, don't you? Things went well enough during the first month after the initial attack. Aurelian withdrew, their return advanced. Then, one day, we got a word from the northeast that Meru had suddenly withdrawn his troops from the field. They hadn't been routed. They just completely ditched the war. Antidas didn't know what to think. Had Meru been bribed by Gallius? Had he lost his nerve? It turns out Meru hadn't lost his nerve, just his whole fucking mind. I brought Antidas' uncle to Ganesa again and he didn't even greet us when we walked into his court. Instead, began a crazed oration. It was like you were listening to a totally different man. He spoke of gods, he spoke of revelations, he spoke of the people and he ultimately just spewed out a mess of the most impassionate insanity I've ever heard. At first, we hoped it was nothing but an act to cover Meru's real doubts about the war and so the uncle stayed into the night to discuss it with him further. When he finally came out of the palace, his skin white as gypsum. I tried to fin fish out some of the details, but the only thing he said was, God help us. He actually believes every word. It's all over. And so it was. All just, li uh, just like that? It was the turning point marking the end of Antidas' good fortune. The Imperial Guards ambushed and decimated the Ordu and suddenly Gallius was free to give Antidas the attention he deserved. Of course, we didn't see it this way back then as Antidas had us convinced that the prophecy was coming true and nothing could stop him. Except Gallius' legions, of course, laughs the beggar, the laugh turning into a violent cough that stops him for a moment. 
Viras, he says finally, as if the name still invoked pain. It was a disaster, a complete and utter fucking disaster. If Antidas didn't run, he would have lost everything there. When we got back to Terran, he practically barricaded himself in this compound and that was the last I saw of him. No more speeches, no more heart of hearts, no more talks about prophecies. So how did you end up here? Tell you the truth, I just couldn't stomach staying in Terran, pretending like nothing happened. You don't know how Antidas could handle that. Maybe he's just a tougher bastard than I thought. For a while, we thought that he was just laying low, bidding his time and waiting for the right opportunity. Turned out there was no opportunity. He sent an expedition to look for some temple in the wasteland. As if that was his main concern and nothing else mattered. Of course, his luck being what it is, he lost man, uh, most men he sent to that fool's errand and didn't find any temple. Between you and me, I wouldn't be surprised if it exists only in his adult mind. I left shortly after, thought I'd come and see Madurin, see the city that so many men died for. You know what? I don't think it was worth it. Anyway, my throat's getting dry, so it's a time to go and water it. Take care of yourself, stranger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Und damit sind wir durch den Teil durch von der Stadt. Wir haben natürlich noch die Arena. Doran. Ähm, Arena kämpfen. Schreibe ich mal auf meine To-Do-Liste. Und dann werden wir als nächstes, würde ich sagen, nach Osten in den Handelsdistrikt. Go to Trade District. You enter the Trade District, the glittering heart of Maduran's economy. A stream of merchants and their goods flow through the arteries of this district. The tide ebbing and flowing, but never ceasing. Towering over the district is the Golden Dome of the Comercium headquarters. Once a temple of the old gods, now a place of worship for the only god the Comercium truly believes in, money. Pay, 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 says one of the traders, heading out and cursing loudly. Pay to reach the city, pay to enter the city, pay for the privilege to sell my own wares. Where does it stop? Why do you come here then? As much as I hate to admit it, but it is the only real market, nothing else comes close. So you either starve yourself selling your wares to the few villages and outposts that are still around, or you pay through the nose to take your wares to Madurin. What other choice is there? Uh, aren't you the Comercium? I work for myself, that's why I went into trading to begin with. It's not easy, and you have to stay out of smaller towns, but Madurin is big enough to handle all the trading it goes a does now and then some. Of course, we have to rent stalls from the Comercium and pay them a hefty cut at the end of the day, but I like, like I said, what other choice is there? Why do you stay out of small towns? Small towns can only handle so much business, so if you bring your wares there, you'll be a talking, a taking business from the Comercium and they won't like it one bit. Of course, you can sell directly to them, but it won't even cover the trip. So, like I said, you either go to Maduran or service villages and outposts, and they can't afford to pay much. If they pay you with, produ with produce and ore, you still need to sell it, which brings us back to Maduran. What about Ganesa? I tend to stay away from it. The market is smaller, so you sell less and at lower prices, but you pay the same levies. Not to mention that ever since Meru started preaching, Gan preaching Ganesa is ruled by mobs of zealots. While the guards, well, the guards do nothing to rein them in. Uh, yeah. If you want my advice, stay away from it too. Who's running the Comercium here? Strabos, it's all right. If you pay on time and keep your word. Of course, if you miss the payment or try to skip town, it's another story. But that's the nature of the business. Hmm? 
Guck mal hier erstmal grob drum. A Watchtower. A house. A half naked courtesan. Oh, half naked courtesan opens the door. A smiling seductively wants to have a good time. She asks in a soft accented voice, licking her lips. Stall. Carpets for every imaginable occasion, including novelty carpet bags. Exotic Emporium Trader. Looking for something special? Curved swords, spiked pauldrons, that sort of things? Look no further, for you're standing in what one day will be known as Exotic Emporium. Do you not have anything special? Aha. Uh -huh. Every item you see here is special, chosen with care and deliberation, says the trader, raising his eyebrow at the ignorance he's just witnessed. Then again, some of my customers expect only the best and are willing to pay a hefty premium for quality that can't be described as anything other than exceptional. He pulls out a richly decorated axe and sho shoves it into your face, uh, it in your face, inviting you to admire the craftsmanship up close. It is the finest weapon ever created. You can spend the rest of life looking for a finer axe and you'll not find it, yes. It's steel, but don't run away so quickly. It is the purest steel tempered to perfection in the rarest oils. It's a warrior's weapon, made to wreak havoc with every swing of the blade. Try the axe. It's truly one of the finest axes you've ever held. Aha. Uh -huh. Additional passive and hardness bonuses. Achso, für die Axt, ja, super. It's truly one of the finest axes you have ever held. Whoever made it definitely knew their way around a blade. The blade has both primary and secondary bevel. The primary bevel is established well up the axe head to facili facilitate deep cuts, while the edge bevel is slightly blunter to prevent the edge from folding, chipping or dulling quickly. How much? Regretfully, I can't accept less than 600. What else do you have? Is the axe still for sale? No. What else do you have? Looking for anything in particular? Do you have any armor schematics? If you're interested in the Barbario or Numeri armor, I can sell you the schematics for 75 coins. It's a good deal, trust me. What else do you have? Browse the wares. Uh, vor allen Dingen Rüstung. Wir brauchen davon jedenfalls nix. Okay, ähm, dann gehen wir nach Norden erstmal. Merchants Plaza, Abuka. Gehen wir nach Norden. Pflänzchen. Upstairs. Das ist der Verrückte. Abukar. You see a bald, bearded, bearded man fiddling with an old telescope, bearing signs of crude repair. If you want me to do a chart, you're wasting your time, says the man. If X is accents thick and heavy, what chart? I'm a stargazer, says the man impatiently, as if it should have been obvious. But I don't do charts anymore, so don't ask. Now, what do you want? I need a lawmaster. I am that as well, surely. You've heard about Abuka, so tell me what you need and go away. What is this thing? A telescopium. A wonder of wonders. Through it I observe stars and their movements, although it's not the stars but the void between them that captures my attention now. Why? 
I've learned that the void is anything but empty. The darkness hides it well, but nothing can stay hidden forever. There are those who dwell in the void and I've taken it up myself to watch them. Have you seen any yet? I have not. But the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. They are there and nowhere, uh, somewhere. I know that now. What makes you think that? What makes me think that? The wisdom of the ancients contained in the scrolls I found in the ruins of the library of Saros. Oh, the truth they revealed. I burned the scrolls, but I can't burn the words imprinted in my mind. They are the reasons. I watch the void now. What did the scrolls say? They said that the Magi reached far into the void and brought forth beings that are not for this or any other world. Beings that know either, know either life the way we know it nor death. The link has been severed and the gates sealed, but the path remains. The seals can be unlocked and the spells can be reversed unless we stand guard and watch the void. Is that what the scrolls said, word for word? There were dozens of scrolls, reduced to fragments, I had to decipher the message and deduce its meaning, hidden to the unin uninitiated. Any chance you might ever err it a little bit? I am a third generation lawmaster, says Abuka proudly. I do not err. 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 You've mentioned the library of Saros. Do you know where it is? There's nothing there, says Abuka. But if you want to gaze upon the ruins of the greatest library in the world, I won't stop you. Let me mark it on your map. Hmm? What did you seek at the library? Knowledge. What else? I was trying to solve a problem, and I hoped it was the great library of Saros. Uh, that the great library of Saros might shed some light on it. I was mistaken. What kind of problem? I was working on a device to detect energy fluctuations. It could detect random deviations with 80% accuracy, but couldn't handle larger and more frequent fluctuations. Obviously, I miscalculated somewhere, but the nature of the old world's magic is hardly a well-explored field these days. Once has no choice, uh, one has no choice but to make assumptions, which leads to setbacks and disappointments. I thought that magic was gone from the world. Then you thought wrong, the magi are gone, but the magic they unleashed is still here, lurking in our own backyard, waiting for the right moment to strike. How do you fight what that which uh, you can't see? How do you stop that which ca has been uh, prophesized to come? Mm, your, our own backyard, you mean the abyss? What else? We've accepted the abyss and learned to stay away from it. We speak of magic that haunts it without any understanding of what it is and why it's still there, centuries later. Yet, any force that affects the physical world can be detected and measured, even if it's invisible to the naked eye. Um, this device, do you still have it? It's not for sale. Trading success, everything is for sale if the price is right. A man of the world, are you? says Abuka with disdain. You want my device? Then bring me one of equal value. Mm -hmm. So you wanted to explore the abyss? Yes, but not the way fools do it, with sheep, my mystical charts and divining rods. Dangerous spots have abnormal energy spikes, so all you need to do is construct a device that can read them. Easier said than done, of course, but the paths worth traveling are never easy. I have another item I want you to look at. Make it quick. Show him the sphere. Clever, says Abuka thoughtfully, turning the sphere in his fingers. The grooves, they must match something, no? Find what it is and you will have your answer. I have another item you want to, I want you to look at. The jellyfish artifact. It's an object of great power. I can feel it testing the walls of its prison. I can hear its whispers. Take it away before it pollutes my study. I have another item. Show him the map. The Temple of Toragoth, says Abuka after studying the seal. It's a fool's errand. Antidas was searching for it for a long time. Even sent an expedition, but they didn't find anything. Talk to Domitius Ulpius if you want to know more. What do you know of Toragoth? He wasn't of, his wor of this world. None of them were. 
They were brought here and given life, which was the greatest folly of man. Be thankful that they are gone, but remain vigilant and stand ready to delay their return. For we are not what we once were and will be all but helpless against them. Und damit haben wir, glaube ich, alles. Leave. Okay. Mm, characters. Das sind aber jetzt noch alles die von dem anderen. Mining outpost, ja. Actions. Lore. Ah ja, okay, das wird auch alles gesammelt. Okay, dann gucken wir mal weiter. Enter the house. As you enter, a small dimly lit house near the market square, the voices and shouts coming from the market fade away. It's filled with shelves and boxes, leaving very little space for anything else. Parchments, manuscripts, piles in heaps, odd mechanical devices, tools and bottles of dry ink occupy any available surface. Thick dust and cobwebs in the corner suggest that the house hadn't been cleaned in a very long time. An old man in worn-out robe is pacing around the table and other natural obstacles searching for something. His wrinkled prune-like face speaks of decades spent under scorching sun. Although the old man moves around his house with apparent ease, you notice that he's relying on his hands to navigate past the obstacles rather than on his failing eyesight. Sensing your presence, the old lawmaster stops and forces his face into something resemble a smile. Am I expecting you? He asks, struggling to remember. Who are you? I am Tiresias, a humble scholar. There are those who call me a sage, says the man with pride. But I make no claims to such distinction. What can I do for you, my friend? A scholar? The past has always fascinated me, ever since I've heard my first tale about the war with the demons. I knew what I wanted to be. I spent my whole life digging in the ruins. Oh, the sights I've seen, sadly. There were too much for my poor eyes, and I was forced to settle down. Now I make a living trading bits and pieces of my knowledge. For a few coins, he looks at you meaningfully. I'd like to learn something from your master, Sirius. Give him ten Imperials. Tiresias jingles your coins in his palm and returns them to you. You must have mistaken me for a beggar, he says with pride. If you wish to partake in my wisdom and expand your horizons, I'd expect at least 500 Imperials and not a coin less. I've traveled far just to hear you speak, O oh great sage. I wish I had a thousand coins so I could give them to you, but I spent what little I had to come here. I beg you not to turn me away, master. Failure. Alas, my sight has faded now and teaching has become increasingly more difficult. I'd suggest you find a younger lawmaster, if you really are in need of a teacher. Mm. Streetwise nochmal erhöhen, ist mir aber ein bisschen hoch. Uh, sensing your presence, the old lawmaster stops and for forces his face into something resembling a smile. Am I expecting you? He asks, struggling to remember. I'm here for the lessons. Mm. Streetwise nochmal erhöhen. Das tut schon ein bisschen weh jetzt. Failure. Und nochmal kann ich es gar nicht erhöhen. Ja, können wir 500 bezahlen. Lade ich jetzt wieder. 500 ist natürlich schon ein Haufen Asche. Ja, 500. Your impersonate has increased. What? Without skipping a bit, Tiresias gives you an anecdote, a filled lecture on how to appraise relics and artifacts, detect forgeries, 
Trace genealogical trees and make birth charts and charms for noble clients. The lecture gives you an insight into lore, etiquette and impersonate. Mm. What else can you tell me? Absent-mindedly, Theresius shuffles the manuscripts on his desk as if searching for a worthy topic. I assume you've heard many tales about the great war that toppled the old empire. Every fool tells his own tale and thinks it's the truth and nothing but. These tales differ widely, but one thing is constant. The war breaks out, the Kantari demons enter the, fr enter the fray, then the High Lords make their appearance on the battlefield of history. Then the war is over. Both the demons and High Lords disappear, leaving no traces but tales and myths. The High Lords came to our aid because we couldn't defeat the demons on our own. Everyone knows that. How convenient. Indeed, not Theresius. Our understanding of what happened during the war is based on the accounts that are as varied as the tales you hear today. To put it simply, nobody knows what happened back then, but the storytellers and the late historians want to answer the most common questions. What happened? Did the Empire fall? Who is to blame? It's human nature to blame someone else, and since the Kantari aren't here to defend themselves, they make a perfect villain and scapegoat. Are you saying that they didn't start the war? I'm saying that nobody knows what happened, says the old lawmaster. In my humble opinion, the references to supernatural beings or arcane forces made their way into the chronicles many years after the war to make the tales more pan fanciful. Personally, I prefer to keep the facts and use the Lectio fa uh, Facilior method when appropriate. Lectio Facilior? It means the easier choice and it's a suggestion. When facing several possible interpretations of an event described in texts and manuscripts, a wise researcher should prefer the less complex interpretation. Interpretatio. The one that introduces less out of context of fictional animal elements while mini maintaining wholeness and coherency of the story. The Kantari demons and the High Lords are mentioning too often to be nothing but fiction. You cannot deny the existence simply because it doesn't fit into your big picture. What's your explanation then? Anything but these metaphysic assertions, well beyond the laws of the material world. You can't prove that gods or demons do exist as well as I cannot confute it. It's a matter of faith or beliefs, not rational, rational reasoning. What about the machines? The said the gods taught the magi, gave them the tools and the knowledge to build them. Alas, we lost much. Knowledge, technology, art, arts, culture, history doesn't proceed in a straight line, my friend. Like ripples in a pond after you've thrown in a stone or waves in the sea. Civilizations start from humble villages, grow stronger reaching their top, then wither and fade just like men and women, women do. Peaks and pits, a never-ending cycle, always similar, never the same, but I'm distressing again. I am not denying anything, my friend. Quite the opposite. Technology did reach astounding levels. The fact that uh, now we have often unable even to understand its use is actually our greatest failure. But again, it's mankind we are referring to, nor gods nor demons. We once reached the peak of our civilization, looking beyond the horizon, whereas now we are only able to see the bottom of the pit where we are living now. Yet, fear not, my friend, I am confident that someday things will change for the better, even if I am well aware that I won't be there to witness. Okay. I'm expecting you? Mm. Okay, dafür haben wir jetzt 500 ausgegeben. Jetzt haben wir Impersonate 3. Glückwunsch, super. Ich werde das nochmal laden ähm, und mir das aufschreiben. Äh, Maduran Trade District ähm, Norden mit Typen im Haus reden. 500 Imperials. Da Street weiß. Hm. Vielleicht haben wir da später noch bessere Optionen. 
muss ja jetzt nicht unbedingt, ich weiß nicht, wie mir das jetzt überhaupt weitergeholfen haben soll. Carpets for every imaginable occasion, including a novelty carpet bags. Und da haben wir noch ein Haus. Und das hier ist auch noch ein Haus. Nazir. Welcome to Nazir's Carpet DM. Size the day and buy yourself the nicest wool carpet. Money can. Starts the shop storekeeper, then stops abruptly. Realizing that you aren't in the market for rugs. Say, friend, says the man, changing his tone. How would you like to make a thousand Imperials? Keep talking. It's a simple tale. I wish to buy a, ge a gem. It's a rare yellow sapphire, cut to perfection. Unfortunately, Silvanus is not a reasonable man. I've offered him a thousand Imperials, yet he still refuses to sell, making a fool out of me. Not very neighborly of him, is it? He used to live next door and sell sp spices. Then he made some powerful friends and bought a house in the palace district, right next to the palace. The nerve, eh? So here's the deal. Bring me the stone, I'll pay you a thousand Imperials. I don't care how you acquire it, that's between you and Sylvanus. And if he ends up dead? Like I said, friend, says Nazia, putting his hand on your shoulder. That's between you and Sylvanus. I'll go and take a look then. Mhm. Ob das jetzt mit meiner Reputation irgendwie zusammenhängt? So einen Wildfremden einfach anzusprechen mit, äh, wie wär's, wenn du einen Edelstein für mich äh, klaust, ist doch ein bisschen seltsam. Das Haus ist einfach nur leer. Da haben wir den Palace District. Aha. Da war keine Tür drin. Na. Farmer. Madoran Blacksmith. Looking for anything in particular? Mm, do you have any sharpening stones? A few, says the blacksmith, but they won't come cheap. The last group of prospectors never made it back, so our supplies are running low. Mm. Crafting schematics. Of course. Weapon. Naja, okay. Da ist sonst nichts. Farmer. A deeply tanned fellow works at loosening some netting on a cart laden with sacks and baskets of produce. His uh, thinning hair jerks about as he vigorously yanks a corner knot free and tosses the net to the front of the cart, pausing just long enough to wipe his forehead with the back of his forearm. He grabs a basket of potatoes and turns to carry it over to the nearby stall. He moves with uh, the strength and efficiency of one well accustomed to physical labor. Got a moment? Yeah, several, he grunts as he sets the basket down by the stall and begins walking back to the other cart. Planning to spend them all on these baskets, though, he grabs another basket and pauses to give you a grin. But if you can work and talk, I can talk and work, he slides the basket off the cart and turns for the stall. Uh, uh, roll up your sleeves and grab a basket of onions, fair enough. All work and no play makes a bore of a man by end of the day. Ever heard that? I much prefer carrying my food on a plate than by the basket. However, I understand the value of time. You rub a couple of coins together in an outstretched hand. Perhaps a couple of coins is worth the delay? A couple of drinks on me at the end of the day wouldn't be so bad, right? Yeah, machen wir das erste. Fair enough. Name's Eugenius. He says as the two of you walk over and stop, stoop to sit 
the basket down. You head back to the cart and grab a sack of what is probably dried beans as Eugenius lifts a basket of dust radishes. I can't help but wonder what I have got to say that would be important enough for you to lend a hand to hear it. Looks to be a good load here. Is it not difficult raising a harvest out here? Eugenius squints his eyes inquisitively and grins. What do you think? He pauses and looks up into the sky, his face turning grim. Some years are brutal, trying to scratch a living out of the dirt. You feel like a damn fool trying to coax stubborn seeds up out uh, of the ground into this. He waves his hands around. Hellish world. Who can blame him, right? But then, some years, a few showers here and there, it almost feels like the gods might just still give a shit. They probably don't, he quickly and matter-of-factly adds. But then you go from a year where you're spitting on prickle fruit seeds every day just to get them to sprout. To a year, uh, to a year like this one, he points to the baskets of produce. It's almost enough to give a man a religion again. Why do you keep doing it? Well, we gotta eat, don't we? He laughs heartily, heartily for a few moments before trailing off and wiping his eyes. He lets out a mirthful sigh, then turns serious again. It's a noble profession, you know. Farming, I mean. I'm no house noble by a long shot, but it's an honest living. Keeps my conscience clean and my neighbors fed. These are troubled times, no doubt. But at the end of the day, I know I took care of myself and didn't hurt anyone while doing it. The harder I work, the more I grow. The more I grow, the more money I earn and the money, food, uh, the more food there is for you to buy. Uh, yeah. Sometimes what's good for one is good for another. A novel notion these days. So in the old good days, you men stall in the market and get rich, I suppose. Potatoes, onions, dust, radishes, and some very healthy tomatoes. No luck with yellow girls, I'm guessing. A genius stops and eyes you quizzically. None, they won't take, how do you know? They're conspicuously absent from your otherwise impressive harvest. They don't tend to do well in areas where tomatoes grow that large. Your soil is probably ascent bent. Prior to turning soil for the new season, that has the winter such grown in thick? He smiles. It does. It is possible to shift your soil's nature. If you can, acquire crushed limestone. Enough to fill two of those sacks. Your best bet would likely be the salt mines to the west. Cook the limestone fiercely and then grind it fine. Spread it evenly over your gardens and you'll likely see measurable harvest increased. Including yellow goods if you want it. You're the farmer, but I'd leave a spot untreated for tomatoes. I'd hate to see those beauties suffer. If it works, I'm in indebted to you for this advice. Thank you. Another question? Shoot! So in the good years, you men stall in the market and get rich, I suppose. Ha! I'm hardly running out of holes to bury my profits in, if that's what you mean. But the good years get me by. The bad years, I grow enough to eat, which is about all a simple man can really ask for, I suppose. But yeah, good years, I hold the sur surplus to market and make some coin for putting it back. It actually pays very well when I got it to sale. And this isn't my stall. When I've got this much surplus, I sell in bulk to a merchant here at the market. There's too much work to do back home when the crop is coming in strong. Margin isn't as good after you consider the discount to the merchant and the commercium's fees, but the time saved ensures I haven't got crop rotting in the field. The commercium always gets its cut, doesn't it? Are they difficult to work with? Eugenius smiles and looks around. You wouldn't stand in front of my house and talk shit about my onions, would you? He raises his eyeballs, eyebrows as he gives you a moment for compensation to take hold. Look, the Comercium does what it does and I do what I do. If you want to, want to sell in the major towns, you gotta pay the fee. So no, they are no difficult to work with as... Uh, they are not difficult to work with as... 
they are very efficient and processing my payments and papers. And they keep the market square well guarded. So good for all, right? Or I just not skip the major towns, travel around and sell whatever settlements are out there. Ha! Huh, are you kidding me? First of all, there's only a handful of shitty settlements anywhere close out, uh, close out there, and the risk ain't worth trying to get to all of them. Sure, I could probably avoid a commercium fee, but surviving long travels in the waste comes with its own costs. One customer you can count on on there are the damned raiders. Problem with them is they are real partial. Uh, they are real partial to those steal one and get the rest for free deals. Those assholes only buy in bulk too. Some merchants merchants try to do it though. It's a rough life, but the ones that make it, I guess, do all right. You've got to be crafty enough to pull that life off. Folks that try to bypass the Comercium tend to have bad things befall them sooner or later though. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. Now another question. Do you own your land or does it belong to Gallius? I'm fortunate enough to have my own little piece of the dirt out there. Doesn't mean Gallius can't take every potato I own and call me up to arms at a moment's notice though, does it? For the good Madurin, the honor of House Aurelian, and defense of the Empire, whatever we are calling it these days. But until then, yeah, beats working another man's fields for him, right? How do you think Madurin fares these days? Better than most, which isn't saying much. Raiders are as abundant in the wastes as gold in a Comercium's vault. The noble houses are all the same, too paranoid to trust each other, rightly so I'd wager, and hellbent on being the first to dig up whatever artifacts that might secure them a clear advantage over the others. I guess Gallius is no worse than any other. He likes taxing us maybe a little too much, but I hardly notice it that with the Comercium's hand always in my pocket. Let the houses play their politics, I suppose. I worry about making sure we are we all eat. Last I checked, that still seems to be an important to be important to everybody. Another question? Shoot! A farmer philosopher with a heart of gold, you're quite a rarity. Ha! Huh, there is no deep thought here. A man like me doesn't have time for that. It's just common sense and don't be making me out for some fool of a saint. Like I said, in the end, it's what good for me was. It's what's good for me that really counts. But I rest easier knowing that what I do helps more than just myself. And it doesn't hurt that everybody that likes to eat likes a farmer, right? It's not everybody can do what I do out there. Another question? How much does the Comercium charge you? Depends on how well you're doing. Usually it's about 3, 4 on 20. I think they take it a little easier on us that are dealing in crop goods. It's hard enough uh, raising crops out there. Uh, they put too big a fee on us and it's just not worth the effort to raise surplus. The Comercium likes to eat as well as any of us, I guess. I bet they'll take as little as 2 on 25 if you approach them the right way. You're right, they don't want to run farmers off completely. They're a cornerstone of the commerce. Tell them you need the extra money to put towards increasing your yields. It means more. Produce at market and more fee income for them. They should go for it. Eugenius looks stunned. He starts to say something, then stops. He chuckles and looks eyes with you. Locks eyes with you. How would you tell me this? Sometimes what's good for one is good for another, right? He grins. Very wise words, indeed. I consider your suggestion. Thank you. Another question? Shoot. I should probably uh, let you get back to work. Ja, wir sind ja am rumlaufen und helfen jedem. Ähm, aber für diesen Teil hat sich's ausgeholfen. Und dann werden wir beim nächsten Mal wohl den Rest hier von der Zone erkunden. Und schauen, was hier noch so ist. Weiter raussuchen kann man da nicht. Also das hier ist ein Tempel, da kann man aber nichts machen. 
Another Templar from the olden days, judging by the noise coming from the inside, instead of worshipping uh, dusty old symbols, the locals prefer to worship the beauty of a female body. Uh -huh. Okay. Gut, also, dann schauen wir beim nächsten Mal weiter. Bis dann!